Let's look at some of these stories in a bit more detail. Noah Kigali is a Conservative councillor and political commentator who joins me on the line. Good morning, Noah. Good morning, how are you? Let's start with the front page of The Times and this story, a sort of preview of the review we're going to get tomorrow. What do you think the answer is to dealing with some of the problems that the Met Police have been facing over the last few years? I think it seemed inevitable to a lot of people over the past few years, especially, that the Met being broken up in the long term is realistically the only solution here. Everything else kind of feels like a sticking plaster. It is so, so bloated, and there's things that really... Something like ter terrorism command for the entire country probably shouldn't be in the Met anyway. And when that kind of thing is in there, it just adds to this to this mo massive, massive organisation that it doesn't seem like anybody can really get a grip on. And when the public's faith is is waning quite fast, it does seem like something large needs to be done that the public can really see. Tinkering around the edges isn't going to restore public faith in policing in this country. Something massive needs to happen to really reinstate that. Is, is it tinkering around the edges? I mean, Sir Mark Rowley's done some significant things to, to change the culture as quickly as he can, including things like setting up a hotline where you could report on conduct of police. And many measures have already been put in place. You're saying none of that scratches the surface. I, I don't think it really does with the majority of the public. Most people aren't going to be directly affected by the bad outcomes that we're seeing in policing at the moment. They're, but they're still losing faith and they're still losing trust so the things they need to see to restore that faith aren't hotlines as important as they are it is massive institutional change that really changes the image of policing rather than just making it easier to report issues when you say institutional change what do you mean so something like breaking up the met into smaller bodies it may do that so when people go around the country and somebody say in a rural area will have a lot more contact with their local police um, and possibly in a not in a lot more um, in a lot more active and uh, closer way than lots of people might do in London so replicating something like that even though that's not perfect will possibly go a long way to restoring that faith so we, we need to work out how to bring the idea of local policing and that idea that we've kind of lost of, of the local copper back to somewhere like London where that's definitely been lost because, you know, we're, we're trying to cater to a, a massive, massive population. Yes, so Mark Rowley's promised to restore public trust with a sort of series of measures, overhauling professional standards, revetting officers, investigating again anyone previously accused of sexual or domestic violence. Um, but whether the review will find that he can actually manage to do that uh, will be a separate matter. We'll have many details on that for you tomorrow. Um, now, let's talk about the Home Secretary's trip in Rwanda. From your perspective, how do you think it's going? I think it's reinforced. Anybody that agrees with her is kind of, you know, finding positives in it. And anybody that disagrees is finding the negatives. It's not really changing anybody's mind, I don't think. And the, the comments about the Rwanda deal being a blessing for migrants are a really good example of that. So obviously in her mind and lots of people... And that's what the Home point. Secretary said we should yeah. stress, yeah. So in, in her mind and lots of people's minds across the country, for a refugee or an asylum seeker, anywhere but home is just by default a blessing. But for lots of people in this country who are you know, opposed to the policy or, or more sceptical of it, the idea of calling it a blessing and Suella Braverman positioning herself as somebody that is essentially handing them out um, is incredibly odd. So what we're seeing here, I think, is, a, is an entrenching of the views that lots of people over the country already have. And if that's the outcome she's looking for, then she is well and truly succeeding. If she's looking to convince people, then I don't think she is. Part of the problem is whether th this trip may be worth nothing if legally they can't get it through the courts. No, so this is interesting in that um, it does seem like the Strasbourg court are starting to give some concessions. So through the Rule 39 procedures, they may start allowing the government um, to make a representation at the injunctions ra or pre-injunction rather than just stopping the flights as a whole. And the government think that either that buys them more time or that will allow them uh, to you know, stop the flights being stopped, essentially. In the long term, what this is especially interesting um, is that it means potentially that we are less likely to get, to get into a serious spat where Conservative MPs are calling for us to leave the ECHR, which would be an incredibly internal party rift and is, is, is probably quite high on the list of priorities for this government to avoid. So 
this may give a bit of leeway for the government and for the Conservative Party on this front, and that might be part of the larger, larger picture and larger strategy here. Yeah, it was the Strasbourg court that intervened really at the 11th hour last summer to issue that injunction that suspended all flights to Rwanda until UK courts had ruled on the policy's legality. We, we don't yet know what infrastructure she'll put in place to secure the fact that those planes are going to take off. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think this is the broader question, is that the government's making a lot of promises here. And, and that idea of stop the boats has been something that's been plastered on basically every wall and podium in sight. But whether that's actually going to happen is an entirely different thing. And there's a risk that the government has over-promised here and that the, the sounds coming out of the government are too positive and that if they don't actually come to anything, the government could be in a little bit of hot water, mm. having promised the world to those who who want a really tough immigration policy and not actually manage to deliver it. Was it right that they didn't invite all parts of the press to come on the trip? I, I think you, you see this a lot with, with all political parties and all governments. It makes me quite uncomfortable because the, the press is quite an important part of, of scrutiny. But for something really controversial like this and somebody who is, uh, Suella Braverman being you know, you're prone to the, to the odd PR mishap, that photo, for example, being a being a bad judgment call. It, it was probably a call made that the that the negative press over not inviting everybody uh, was less bad than the the potential negative press over inviting everyone and having them pick up on someone on something quite damaging. That's a gamble they're prepared to, uh, to take, I guess. Um, there's a couple of stories on strike action. The front page of The Guardian has health union members in a push to reject this NHS pay deal. They're going to get a one-off sum and then a 5% pay rise. That story is also taken in tandem with RMT members will be voting today whether they should end uh, their set of strikes. Do you feel like the, the tone of the conversation at least has changed from even this time a week ago that we are looking a little bit more about potential solutions rather than endless rolling strikes yeah there is a glimmer of hope here so on the health unions the, the deal on the table at the moment is a two percent bonus a four percent covid uplift and then in may uh, a five percent pay rise so the nhs workers say no movement or organization that is pushing to reject this deal still want 19 percent. i think everything we've seen so far suggests that is definitely not going to happen what may happen, though, if they do choose to reject it, is they may get closer to the 9%, which is what the RMT has agreed. So that's probably what they're looking for. And this is some of the issue with you know, strikes and pay issues across the public sector, is everybody is going to now try and or is trying to match each other. And if any, if any group gets a higher proportion, they think the government has more, has more room to give. But again, it is starting to look a bit more hopeful. On the railways, I think ASLEV have... That deal's not done. Um, but the RMT isn't advising people how to vote on their deal. So that kind of thing is positive. Um, and hopefully by the end of the summer, potentially, these things could all be rectified. Um, I think there is another aspect here is that lots of the unions are, are aware there are local elections coming up in May. And that leaves you know, any governing party of any time uh, vulnerable to pressure um, because any crisis just before any election, be it local or national, is unhelpful. Mm. So there will be more of a push to sort these things out. Noah, thank you very much for your time this morning going through the papers. Noah Kigali, Conservative councillor and political commentator. It's been great to have your time.